Um, I appreciate you guys coming out this afternoon. I know this is going to be a very interesting uh, opportunity for you to learn about pre-employment strength testing. Um, I want to begin with a little background about how we got here today. Uh, at Network Insurance Services, what we did is about four years ago, we ran some analysis on our current book of business for our customers and their workers' comp. And what we found was about 80% of our claims for our customers was coming from workers who had been there for less than 12 months, new hires. What we did then is we actually drilled it down just a little bit more and we discovered that about 90% of those claims and the dollars that were being paid that were really costing our customers the money came from three areas, strains, sprains, to shoulders, backs, and knees. And we thought surely if we know who's having these claims and what's happening to them, there's gotta be something we can do to prevent that. So we went out and we spent about a year and a half researching a lot of different uh, opportunities and options for that. And at that point, we found a solution that we believe is going to be extremely interesting and exciting for you all. Let's take a look. So the basic premise that we have is that most of these injuries is where there's principally been a mismatch between the physical ability of that worker and the demands of the job. So what we want to do is we want to go ahead and avoid hiring other people's headaches. So we're looking to find something that's going to do a pre-employment or there's actually, actually some opportunity on a post-injury uh, situation as well where we can help control the costs or eliminate the claims from ever occurring. This sort of technology is certainly applicable to both new hires like we discussed, prospective employees who've been furloughed or laid off that's coming back to your company and you want to make sure that they're still capable of doing the job. Any injured workers who are looking to come back onto the job after suffering that injury and they've been released back to either MMI or if it's a personal injury, a release from their doctor. And of course your current workforce or your incumbent workers where they are either uh, looking at a baseline screen for them or if we're looking at a situation where they're changing from one job duty to a new job duty and it might have higher physical demands at the new position. So when we went out and did our search, we discovered there were basically four types of strength tests that are available there. You have your isometric testing, which was very popular in like the 30s and 40s and 50s where they're lifting objects that are immovable, where it's a fixed object. Of course, the problem with that is it's number one, it's very old uh, technology and there's a high level or chance of injury with that kind of testing. The second type is isoinertial, which is where we're lifting barbells, your strength training. Um, it's very common with some uh, physicals where they will load baskets with weights and have to pick them up or uh, lift them onto a table pops possibly or even um, climb a ladder with a, a little bit of weight. Uh, the next thing we have is simulated work environment as a possible uh, testing solution. Uh, the problem with simulated work environment that we found is it's very lengthy to do. It's extremely costly to do. You have to recreate uh, the job tasks. Um, it's pretty hard to simulate all the different jobs in the, that are available out there. Um, it's just not very cost effective or really very uh, efficient. And of course, the one that we're using, which isokinetic, which is speed control but not the force. So it's resistance through time, essentially. Now, isokinetic technology um, is really, and the testing that we're doing, is, is actually specifically designed for the areas that we had an issue, shoulders, backs, and knees. And what we're going to be testing with this uh, CRT is 83% of the muscles and systems used in physically demanding jobs, specifically in jobs that require lifting. Now, isokinetics has been around for 40 plus years. Uh, since the early 60s, they've been using isokinetic testing. It's extremely popular with people that, uh, institutions you might be familiar with, NASA, the U.S. military, NFL, um, and a lot of the large leading employers uh, across the country. The problem with isokinetics, at least up until now, is that it just wasn't, a, there wasn't a cost-effective way to deliver those kind of services and tests to smaller employers where you guys could really get the benefit. Well, CRT has managed to harness that. One of the things that we have with CRT and them being able to harness this for your ability is that they have national statistics and this is absolutely staggering. So I want to make sure you guys understand what this means. 
we are able to predict with over a 98% certainty that if the individual passes the CRT testing for the jobs that they are applying, that they will not suffer an injury, strain or sprain, musculoskeletal disorder for those joints, the shoulders, backs and knees. That's huge. If you could hire a new person and know that they're not going to get hurt or have a strain or sprain to their shoulder, back or knee with a 98% certainty, that's a pretty big deal. Is, is this legal? You know, Herb, that's a great question. I'm glad you've asked it. We actually were wondering the same question. The ADA, as you can see here, actually has specific guidelines that allow for strength and agility testing. What's interesting about this test is exactly that. It's not a physical. It is a pre-employment strength and agility test, which the ADA has allowed specifically because it falls under a safety re regulation. We don't want to knowingly put someone in a position of harm where they would be unsafe in the work environment. So it's absolutely, it's absolutely legal. Um, in fact, when we made presentations with uh, the Department of Health and Labor here in Colorado, as well as the Division of Insurance, uh, they were really excited about it because it would actually um, quantify and objectively show that the person was capable to do the job. Some other legal considerations since you were asking about that that are specific here to Colorado is that about two years ago we had a law passed which was Senate Bill 241 and what 241 said was that um, for, the, for the purposes of an impairment rating as it relates to workers compensation you can no longer use a baseline data to take an apportionment. So an apportionment on a workers' comp claim is when we would have an established um, a baseline screen, for instance, similar to this, and then the person gets injured and we can show that their injury after a surgery, if it was a back injury or something, that they had only had a 10% reduction in the capacity to do that same range of motion or work. Um, unfortunately, Senate Bill 241, when it was passed, uh, eliminated the options for us to take the apportionment as it relates to the baseline screen for that injury. So we did lose a little bit of our, um, of our bang for the buck kind of on the baseline screening. And kind of to further evaluate that, you have the baseline versus eliminating. And really what we're looking at here with the CRT solution is kind of what we started off with, which we want to just eliminate it from ever coming in the front door. Um, we're not really looking at this as a baselining tool. It has some value there, but really what we're looking at is we want to eliminate that candidate from ever coming through your front door and the claim ever even occurring. Should we be testing current workers? You know, Brandy, that's a great question. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the benefit to having the baseline screen has certainly been deteriorated here in Colorado. Now, CRT tests not just in Colorado, but all over the country. So a lot of the states, there's still a lot of value there. Here in Colorado, while we can't take an apportionment or reduction on the impairment rating any longer, um, it's still a nice tool uh, that you can use to show MMI, which MMI, of course, is maximum medical improvement on a worker's comp claim. So what we can show is if we know we've captured that employee at a moment in time and we know that they could do X, Y, or Z, and then they had an injury for some reason, and then after that injury we could retest them and show that they were back at the same levels they were prior to the injury at X, Y, Z, then we would by definition be at MMI and we could move that claim to closure much, much quicker. Um, so there's definitely value to still testing uh, current employees. But I would caution you um, that the value isn't as strong as it used to be, and there are some pitfalls to testing your current employees. And what I mean by that is when you test a current employee or incumbent workforce, that data is not going to ever be given to you, the employer. It sits out in cyberspace on the CRT mainframe. No one ever sees it. Because obviously, if we give you that result and that person um, that's been working for you maybe for 10 years fails, and then they ask, hey, why have I failed? Well, your shoulder results didn't come back very good. Well, you're going to create a work comp claim because they're going to say, my goodness, I've been working for you for 20 years. I failed this thing because my shoulder's messed up, and I must have done it working for you. So we don't really want to, we don't want to put yourself in that position. Or the other side to that is that you could have a situation where um, they failed the test, and you don't fire them, 
but now you are knowingly putting them in a position of danger. Because again, you know they're not really fit to do that job. You put them out there anyway, and you've kind of opened yourself up for a lot more liability. So um, I would really probably discourage testing in a current workforce here in Colorado, um, just because the value isn't there. It's only going to help you with the MMI situation. Um, you're not going to be able to take the reduction. Um, you're not going to really be able to act on any of that data other than to move the claim forward with MMI. Um, and and it's, just, it's just not quite the same value. So I would save the money and just test the current workforce. Use it as an elimination tool um, rather than really a baseline tool. So the next thing that we thought was really important, certainly for us as well as for our customers, was has this ever been tested? Where are we at with this? Um, you know, we know it's legal, but has anyone ever had an issue with it where they had to test it? Uh, you know, and absolutely, one of the nice things about CRT and, and uh, cost reduction technologies, it's been through the federal courts twice, um, and it's passed both times with flying colors. It's never been an issue, so it has been tested through the court systems. In fact, it's one of the only types of tests like this that actually passes the Dalbert standard. Uh, the Dalbert standard is it's a legal term, and, and essentially what that means is that this isn't junk science, that it is upheld in the court of law, and that it does meet these five criteria in order to be permissible in a court of law. Um, and that's a big deal because you want to know if you're going to be spending that kind of money and you're going to be doing these kind of tests that it has been through the court systems and that it's, it's been validated there. So at this point, what we're going to do is when we're done, we're going to go ahead and go on the machine and you guys get to see exactly what's going on. Um, but if you're watching this video and you would like, you can certainly go to the website and watch the video and see exactly what these folks are going to see in person. So as you're going through the test, what's going to happen is the machine is actually going to be generating um, isokinetic strength curves um, or torque curves. The machine measures torque through a range of motion. Um, and what is really, really cool about this machine is that you can't get hurt ever doing it because the machine doesn't create a weight. As we discussed, it's resistance through time, isokinetic resistance. So what it does is it's actually just taking a measurement of how hard you're pushing or pulling and then it's just returning your own energy back to you. So you can never overexert yourself because if your body is only capable of picking up a water bottle or a pen, it's just going to measure that that's all you can pick up and that's, that's the maximum effort or energy that your body can create. So you don't have to worry about actually sending a prospective employee to uh, a pre-employment physical or one of these other strength tests and they turn in a work comp claim because they got hurt at the test. Um, you just can't do it the way that this, this works. Now as the test goes along, it's going to create these uh, strength curves. And you'll notice there, or you might not be able to see because it's so close, but there's actually five different lines on those curves on each one. And the top one, of course, is a knee, and the bottom one is a shoulder. What's fascinating about this is the reason we do five repetitions is we are gauging the amount of effort. Human body is not capable of reproducing a sub-maximal effort. What that means is we're not robots, we're not cyborgs. So we can't just go through a range of motion, let's say with our arm and say, okay, I'm gonna go half speed this time. Well, we don't know what half speed felt like the second time, the third time, the fourth time. So the reason we do five is when we're looking at a post-injury uh, situation or a person that we have question about the amount of effort that they're putting into on a post-injury situation, we can identify those people very quickly because their graphs will not be tightly grouped. They'll be scattered all over. And in a minute, we can look at what uh, a sub-maximal effort person would look like. Um, but you can see, again, the five repetitions. These are normal isokinetic curves uh, for a shoulder and knee, but that's sort of what it looks like. So what sorts of companies use uh, this kind of technology? Well, all kinds of, of companies can. You can see a whole list of, of people both here locally and nationally in all kinds of different industries. Um, really it comes down to any job position that you might have uh, that has any sort of physically demanding components to it. 
So we've got a lot of different success stories here. We've got some information on manufacturing clients. Uh, we have uh, the statistics on how their claims have been reduced by 78% of severity and 58% of frequency. Um, we've got strains and sprains and how those have been reduced. Uh, food distributors, same sorts of inf information. These are both local and national information um, examples of customers that have been doing uh, this testing. And you can see dramatic results, dramatic amounts of decrease um, in all industries. Food, construction, healthcare and hospital networks, um, a significant reduction in their claims, frequency and severity. What do we need to do to get started? You know, that's a fantastic question. Um, it's really pretty simple. The next thing to do and, and what we got to do to get you going is First thing we have to do, of course, is identify what job classes do you want to test. Now, of course, it doesn't make any sense at all to test for job classes that you're not having injuries in or that aren't physically demanding. So would you want to test a bunch of office workers, uh, clerical staff? Yeah, probably not. They're going to probably pass that test. And you're probably not having a lot of injuries, um, the strains and sprains certainly, from those folks. I wouldn't recommend testing those guys. Identify those that are driving your claims, your strains and sprains, um, and that have the physically demanding jobs. That's where you're going to see the benefit of the buck. Now, can we uh, discriminate between class codes? Yes, we can. We do not have to test every single person in the company. We can discriminate between class codes. So I have a labor class and I have a clerical class, and I can say, okay, I'm going to test the labor, but not the clerical. That's perfectly okay. That's legal you cannot discriminate within the class code. So once you begin testing within a class code, you have to test everyone that's coming into that class code. Does that make sense? Is that, that seems pretty fair, right? Um, so we can't, certainly can't uh, discriminate within that class code. So once we know who we're gonna test, the next thing we need to know is, well, what kind of physical demands do they have? So we can do a job task analysis um, where we're gonna go ahead and identify the lifting requirements for those positions. Most of our customers already have job descriptions, and within those job descriptions, you've probably already paid someone to come out and do an evaluation, and you've got lifting requirements typically um, within those job descriptions as far as how much they need to lift, how often, that kind of thing. Um, that's really what we need in order to kind of move forward. We're going to take that job description, which includes the lifting requirements um, in an eight-hour shift, and we're going to send that to the guys at CRT. CRT folks are going to convert that raw data for the job task analysis or the job description, they're going to convert that over um, to a CRT bias score. And they're going to do that using, and again, one of the things that, well, another thing, I keep saying one, but one, another thing that we really, um, really like about the CRT uh, solution is that it uses so much information that has already been published and is already accepted by our government which is why it passes through the courts so simple because it's very hard for the federal government or for any judge to throw something out that's based on data that they're publishing. So what we use is we actually use the U.S. Department of Labor uh, Dictionary of Occupational Titles. That's a mouthful, I know. Uh, but it's this huge book. It looks like a big phone book. And in that is um, all these jobs that the government has already tested and they already know what the lifting requirements are, and they've slotted it on this big table from sedentary all the way out to very heavy. And of course, and we'll, we'll look at that in just a second, obviously the heavier you lift or the more often you do it, then the heavier you are on the scale and then the lighter are the lighter on the scale. So they've got this huge phone book of all these occupational titles and they've already slotted these folks down this, down this tree. We're gonna take your job description and your job task analysis and slot it into that same tree and that same table and that same graph that the government has already used so that we know what the expectations are for that job position. So once we've got that and we've converted it then to a bias score, which is a body index score. Now the body index score relates to uh, the table um, that we're going to look at for the um, dictionary of occupational titles, sedentary to very heavy. Um, and that's kind of where some of the CRT magic comes in. That's a proprietary um, formula that they use that convert that from sedentary to a number. It's a numeric value um, that corresponds to the, the weight scales. And then we just begin testing the applicants. 
So this is that table that we had discussed that I was telling you about. So this is um, what we're looking at. You can see it ranges, of course, from sedentary to very heavy. And as you go more repetitions for a certain weight, the more you do it or the less you do it, it will slide you down the scale. And again, this is actually not something that CRT puts out. The U.S. Department of Labor is who sends this out. Um, so it's pretty hard for any judge to, to give you a hard time about it when it's their stuff that they're putting out. So it's pretty great. So what we have here is this is where I mentioned there was a bias score, a numeric value, and it corresponds then to the sedentary through very heavy that you can see and how that works. So what's going to happen is, if we kind of go through a, a sample of what we're looking at, we'll run an individual. So in this case, it's John Doe. We're going to run the individual through the test. At the end of the test, that data gets sent to CRT, runs through their formula, their algorithms, and it spits out a test result sheet, which looks just exactly like this. Uh, it tells you who's testing, who they're working for, and what they're doing. And then it's going to give them both the body index score, the numeric value, as well as the corresponding Dictionary of Occupational Title designation. So in this case, uh, John Doe was testing for a warehouse. He scored 175, which was a medium in this situation. Well, and I had highlighted it before in some of those other slides, and this is why, because the job task analysis that was done for this warehouse worker in this position required that they have a score of 226 or heavy in order to qualify. This is a pass-fail. It's not a gray area. They either have the strength or they don't. So in this case, John Doe, who tested at 175, a medium score, doesn't pass. You don't offer him the job, and, and you're moving on. Since it's a pre-employment test, and it's a, it's a strength test, not a physical, you don't have to do it in that pre-employment post-offer window. You can do it truly as a pre-employment test, you just tell him, hey, John Doe, you're not a candidate for the position. Sorry, and we're moving on. Do we need to make a reasonable accommodation for the job if they fail? You know, Brandy, another great question. Um, you know, no, you don't, because uh, the person's ability to provide the strength necessary for the job isn't in a protected class for the ADA. Now, if they have a uh, disability and they are part of a protected class, you may need to make a reasonable accommodation for that job um, or for that position in that particular candidate, but not based on passing or failing this test. It would be strictly based on the fact that they're already in a protected class with the ADA, um, but just failing the test does not make them uh, a protected class by the ADA. So what are some of the values um, on the objective screening for post-injury cases? Well, I think the biggest key to that is exactly what I just said. It's objective screening. And unfortunately, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with, so much of the doctors are out there with very subjective, a lot of subjective treatment. How do you feel? Do you think it's getting better? Well, what we can do now with the CRT in a post-injury situation is we know exactly how they're progressing. We know at point A they were able to do this, and now, two or three weeks later into treatment, we can retest them. What was the improvement or lack of improvement? And we can quantify that objectively, and we know exactly what the improvement has been for that individual. I know one of the things that we've seen a lot of times with our customers and when we're looking at a workers' comp claim is when you get your modified duty task letters or you get that return to work potential. The doctor sends back that M164 form or the progress report that you get from them after the visit, and they just check, oh, five pounds, lifting restrictions, no push or pull, and it seems like that's all they ever check, or 10 pounds maybe. Well, what we can do with this is on a post-injury, we can retest them, and we know exactly what they can push and pull. They don't have to just guess or say, well, I don't know, maybe 10 pounds. We can tell them exactly, hey, this person's capable of lifting or pushing or pulling uh, 20 pounds, 30 pounds, whatever it might be. And it's an actual number that's based on actual objective findings, not the subjective, oh, what do you think, Bob? You think it's feeling better? So that's certainly a, 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 certainly a very valuable tool. And, and quite frankly, um, something that the physicians a lot of times want. Um, cost reduction technologies is actually founded back in Iowa, and it was founded by a bunch of doctors and physical therapists. They were looking for a way to objectively show 
improvement through the therapy process. That's how this thing was all born. So um, a lot of the docs are certainly very much on board with trying to, trying to use this kind of testing. Um, and it's exciting to them. Again, when we were presenting it to the um, Department of Health and Labor here in Colorado, the Workers' Comp um, Division of Insurance, they had three medical examiners in the room and they were all so excited, like, oh my gosh, this would be so great to actually be able to, to um, do, we call evidence, they call evidence-based treatment where you know that you have evidence to prove that the treatment is working. Um, and it was, it was fantastic. So it was really, uh, it was fascinating for a, a lay person like myself, I'm in insurance, um, to see the doctors and, and they recognized the strength curves immediately. They knew exactly what was going on and the excitement that they saw uh, and the value that they saw to show the evidence-based treatment. So it's certainly, uh, certainly a pretty valuable tool there. Um, you know, as I mentioned too, we can use it on the post-injury. Uh, earlier we mentioned uh, the baseline versus screening. Obviously, if you have a baseline test, we can't use it to offset the indemnity or the impairment rating, but we can show MMI so we can move claims to closure quicker uh, a lot of times using this testing. Um, and, you know, the other thing, too, is that we can objectively find people who are not participating in their rehabilitation project. And I have to be real careful about that because um, I'm sure you guys have had to deal with that claim where you feel like, oh, this person's just milking it. Um, sometimes people say they're malingering. Well, that's sort of a legal definition. We want to stay away from that. Um, what we want to call it is they're looking for secondary gain. Um, they are not being truthful about their rehabilitation process. Well, one of the few requirements that an injured worker has through that process is they have to participate in their rehabilitation. So if we can put someone that we believe isn't participating in their rehabilitation, we can put them back on the CRT machine, we can test that individual, we can objectively evaluate the effort that they are putting into, whether it's a back injury or shoulder injury or knee injury, and we can see that, then we can kind of pull out those guys that might be milking the claim. And we can then show and say, you know, hey Bob, um, I know that you hurt your knee, but doesn't really look like you're even trying here. You know, we need you to try to get better because if you don't try to get better, you're never going to get better. Um, and it's just, you know, it's not going to solve that problem, but it's one more tool that we can use. It's another quiver in our, or arrow in our quiver that we can use to try and move those claims forward to eliminate those people who are trying to take advantage of the situation um, and advantage of the, uh, the system. So what we have here is a couple of slides where we show some strength curves and kind of how this can be utilized in a post-injury situation. So what we'll see on the top of this right here is someone who is on a, it's a back extension, so they're bent over at 90 degrees, and they are going ahead and standing up to a vertical position. The top is a normal slide, a normal uh, screen of someone and what that curve would look like with no injuries or problems. The bottom one, what you'll see is they've lost that, that big hump there to the far right, so what we did is this is actually a, a real situation um, where the worker kept complaining of a back injury, kept complaining of a back injury. So we put them on the test, we put them on the machine, we had them run, and what you can see is they're missing that big hump on the far right-hand side. Well, what that big hump over on the far right-hand side indicates is hamstrings and butt strength. So what was happening is this individual was going to treatment, they'd get feeling a little better, and then they'd go back out on the job, they'd get working, and then they'd come back and, oh, my back is really killing me, it's hurting. They, and we couldn't figure out what's wrong. His MRIs are coming back negative, we can't figure out what's going on. Well, we put them on the machine and we discovered, you know, it's not your back that's having a problem. Your back's just fine. Look at this, back strength's good. The problem is, when you initiate the lift, his butt and his hamstrings that would initiate a lift for somebody were so weak or actually in this guy's case, he didn't really have good body mechanics and he didn't understand how to use his hamstring and his butt muscles, that he kept hurting his back. And it turns out it wasn't a back issue at all. It was an ergonomic issue and a strength issue for his butt and hamstrings. So this is again a way that we can use this tool to kind of help the doctors kind of work through a problem that otherwise they'd have a real hard time diagnosing. Uh, an individual who came in um, and you can see that they had a rotator cuff injury. You can see the dip about halfway through the screen there. Um, and what that indicates is, of course, as you're lifting up, when you get to about that 90 degrees, that's when that rotator cuff is really being stressed. He has the dip because it's hurt. 
He can't. He loses strength through that range of motion. The bottom, sli uh, the bottom graph there is that same, very same person. It's seven months later. He's had his shoulder surgery. He's gone through his rehabilitation. We put him back on the machine. You can see that big dip in the middle is gone. It's filled in. There's one outlying test because that was the very first rep, and he was still a little bit nervous about it. But once he got going, he got going. So again, you can see surgery was successful. The guy's back to normal. MMI. We're moving on. It's great. Such, and again, it's an objective, quantitative evaluation of where that injury is at. It's not how are you feeling, what do you think, it's wow, here it is. So obviously our big focus is of course avoidance. We don't want those people coming through the front door. Um, you know, they might be great people, um, but I'm sure maybe you guys have experienced as well where that person's working for you for two, three days and all of a sudden they've got an injury. Well, you know what? They probably came to you with that injury. We want to avoid that. And not just that, but sometimes we have to protect people from themselves. Sometimes we see where they're good people and they just need that job and they want that job so bad, but they're just not a good fit for it. They don't have the strength necessary to do that job. They're going to wear down over time and they're going to get hurt. And we need to protect them from themselves. So I'm sure that you guys all have uh, excellent uh, safety uh, programs within your companies. Um, we certainly support our customers quite a bit with their safety, safety programs, safety trainings, um, and we certainly think that's a very important and valuable part to every company. But we truly believe that the next evolution in the safety isn't really safety at all. It's your hiring practices. It's who you're letting in that front door. What we want to see is an improvement there because you can talk about safety till you're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, if that person you're talking to, they don't care, they're not interested, or they're coming to you either not as a whole person with an injury already, or they're just not equipped to do the job, you're still going to end up with the injury no matter how much safety you have. So we really truly believe that that next evolution and that way to reduce your costs beyond safety and just training is through that hiring process. And we certainly believe CRT is the answer for that problem. So, do you have any questions? What kind of failure rates do you see? Uh, you know, Herb, that's a great question. And it actually, um, it really depends quite a bit on the types of industries and the jobs that you have. Um, what we have seen from working with a lot of our customers is that um, sort of national averages on a pre-employment physical, which a lot of companies had looked at in the past at doing, um, those sorts of screen out results were probably in the three to 5%. Um, and then for us, with our strength testing, again, not a physical, pre-employment strength test, um, and we see failure rates somewhere between 10 and 15 percent. Um, I actually have a couple of people that are even as high as 18 uh, percent on a failure rate, um, or screen out rate, I guess is what you'd want to look at. Um, and, it, and, you know, as you can imagine, the higher the demand for strength within a class code, um, the higher you're going to have as a failure rate. Um, because just less people that are capable of doing those kind of jobs. So that's really what we're seeing in that area. Any other questions? Great question. What are the costs for the test? Ah, what does it cost? <laughs> Everyone always wants to know. So what's it going to run me? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple of ways to look at that. Um, we certainly uh, structured a couple of ways. We are an insurance agency. That's really our, our focus. Um, and we want our customers to be the very best uh, customers with the lowest losses possible. It, um, it helps them, of course, and it helps us. Um, so we've structured our two-tiering pricing, and the first structure is if you are a customer of ours here at Network Insurance uh, for the workers' comp, because of course that's what this is going to affect is your workers' comp and those premiums and uh, the losses they're, they're in. Uh, plus we like to use it, um, we like to be able to track how it's affecting and how the losses are trending now that you're beginning using it. Um, we discount it by 50%, so it's a $75 test, um, which really is, is sort of a pass-through of what we get charged from CRT to run the machine and to do the evaluation. Um, we're kind of just passing it through to our customers. We're not really looking to make money on it. We're just, um, we're just looking at it as a benefit to our customers. Now, if you're not a customer, and we certainly got a ton of those too, whether you're a national company um, or you have a self-insured program or something where you, you're not insured uh, or even a possible client, and like I said, we've got tons of those as well, it is at $150, which is the retail price of the test. 
Um, and again, what you'll find is that's very comparable. You Maybe you already know, certainly very comparable to a pre-employment uh, physical. Um, those range from 150 up to $250 typically, so we're even on the low end of that. Um, and this is a, obviously a much quicker solution. Um, it takes a lot of the subjectivity that you see with those physicals out of the equation. Um, and quite frankly, we have a much higher um, screen out rate, which is really what you're looking for. You're trying to screen those guys out. So that's, that's kind of the pricing. Any other questions? Great. You know what, you guys? I really appreciate your time. Um, and at this time, let's go ahead and go get on the machine and, and test it out.